Okay, let's uh, let's get started. We have a real special uh, treat today uh, for Cancer Center Grand Rounds. I want to welcome everyone. Um, and today's Cancer Center Grand Rounds uh, will be unique, um, and uh, I think we'll highlight some some extraordinarily interesting and fun aspects of cancer and how cancer is is presented to us as investigators, but also as citizens, and how we portray it in the public media and the public place. Um, Bob Bazell is with us today. Uh, he is an adjunct professor of MCDB. He has a long history of being a um, journalist and reporter uh, in the area of health uh, for NBC, among other outlets. And we'll be talking to us today about cancer in the media, a <clears throat> troubled marriage. Bob? Thank you very much, Dr. Lynch, and thank you all for coming out in the problematic weather. Appreciate it very much. Uh, I know that here at Yale, we're, uh, you're very big on revealing conflicts to, to get off to the start, so I want to—I have one to reveal. Uh, there it is. It, it's, it's a. Oh, oh no! Yeah, I, I, I can stop now. I can stop now if you want. Anymore, you better stop. You're going to pretend to this. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 this is an ugly thing, I know, uh, and the, uh, the truth of the matter was uh, that I had to put it out there because you might have heard about it already and, and you know, you can't, it's very dangerous to live with secrets. I do have an excuse about that. Uh, uh, I, I was, uh, they asked me before I uh, was going to come on the faculty of Yale, so that, well, that was how it happened. We've had Ed Benz give a talk here as well. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, well that's a different story, though. I, that, uh, that was no conflict. So, but getting back, uh, before I even begin, for those of you who work in the hospital, I want to start with a compliment. I taught an undergraduate course uh, at Yale, a residential seminar this uh, uh, term on, on cancer, and it wasn't good because I uh, taught it. It was, it was good because we uh, had some great speakers. Uh, Dr. DeVito came, Do Dr. Lynch came, Susan Main from the School of Public Health came, uh, Ellen Matloff from gen Genetics came. But the reason that I bring this up was that there, there was a young woman in the class who had been diagnosed, uh, and she's fine, but diagnosed with cancer as a teenager, and she related her experience at another hospital, which I won't mention, uh, in the Northeast, another comprehensive cancer center, and she talked about how awful it was that she had been at this uh, this other hospital and uh, some surgeon called her up and said, you have cancer, you have to come in Thursday morning to get a, uh, get surgery. It didn't explain much to her. Uh, every time she came, it was a massive confusion. She got into Yale, she transferred to Smilo, and she said as soon as she started coming here, there was, every day she came, there was a, a sheet showing her exactly what was going to happen, and every doctor knew what every other doctor had, had found, and nurse, and, and it was, so it was a, congratulations, you're doing a good job, and, and, and keep it up. Uh, I've been a reporter for a long time, which I guess is another, I was a reporter for a long time before I came to Yale, and I guess that's just another way of saying that I'm old. But one of the things uh, that I covered in the, you know, fairly early on in my career was, was AIDS. And I want to show you this, this is a clip, and, and you people who work in cancer are used to some frightening things. And there, there's, a, there's a couple things in this, in the, this is a clip that was done on the 30th anniversary of the discovery of the disease that came to be known as AIDS. Uh, and there's, so there's a, two frightening things in this clip that I want you to be aware of. Okay, so the first frightening thing is that silly guy with all that hair that's standing there. Uh, uh, but the other thing is what I, what I actually said in that piece, a, a deadly new sexually transmitted disease. This is a concept that was so astounding that it, it, it really questioned a whole lot of assumptions in medicine, certainly in infectious disease, but in all kinds of medicine. And the fact, and this is a picture of HIV, the fact that this virus, which has 11 genes, uh, could go from the few hundred cases of an unnamed disease that I mentioned in that story, it hadn't even been named yet, to now has infected more than 70 million people in the world and killed 35 million is something that we still just can't get our hands around, that something like that could happen in, in, our, in our lifetime. But of course, AIDS was only one of the things I, re I, I, I talked about, and I did a lot of reporting about cancer, and that's the subject of the, the talk here today is that there's always been, what I, the reason I call it a troubled marriage, is a lot of interaction between claims that various people who are involved in cancer make and the way that me, the, the media reports it. And 
this is a headline from the New York Times in April of 1913, uh, 100 years ago. And it, I know it's really interesting that the, it's given some credibility because the, the doctor was in Boston. You know, it wasn't in New York. So this is, they have New York Times. So there's a, there's, you, you, you get this thing about outrageous claims. Uh, on, and it's a, it's a constant. Those of you who have been in the media, uh, who have been dealing with cancer, you know, have to deal with this all the time. Patients come in and say, they, uh, you know, well, if, if you found the cause, why don't you have something for me? But of course, if you think this is something from the past, uh, this is a cover from Time Magazine just last April of uh, 13. Here we are, we're, we're about to have a cure. And this is not, this too is not a new concept. We go back to something that uh, happened very early on in my own career. Uh, this is a, an ad that was in the Washington Post and the New York Times. Uh, some of you remember from your history books, there used to be a president named Nixon. And uh, there was something called the War on Cancer that was called, actually it was never officially called that, it was the, the National Cancer Act that was put together by uh, a group of people uh, to try to get the, the country to vastly increase the funding for cancer to try to find a cure. And cancer was thought of as one disease and there was going to be a cure. And this effort, even though it culminated in, in Nixon signing the act in December of uh, 1971, had begun in the 50s when the polio vaccine came online and antibiotics did and there was this faith that medicine could just overcome everything. And it was all a result of, of a woman named Mary Lasker. It's a picture of Mrs. Lasker, who was one of the most astounding people in the history of medicine. She was, uh, she was vastly wealthy and intelligent, but she could have used her wealth and intelligence for a lot of things. And she used it basically to create the NIH as we know it today. And per with particularly with an emph emphasis on cancer. And this, this is a, a great piece of history and, and something that anybody who's, who's interested in the history of cancer uh, it would be well advised to look into. But one of the things that happens when you declare a war is you, ha you ask, uh, well, are we winning the war? And I have Dr. DeVita, who is sitting in the back here, and, and I spent many, m much of his life as director of the National Cancer Institute answering the question, are we winning the war on cancer because we declared war? And, and of course, it's never an easy thing to, an to an answer whether we're winning a war, even if it's an actual war. Like you only have to think about the war in Iraq to say, yeah, well, who won that one? Let alone a metaphorical war. But the way that that question is usually answered is with these, these statistics, which are uh, what's called the age-adjusted death rate. And you can see that the, the, the rate went up for a little while after the war on cancer was declared, and then it started to go down a bit. And uh, that's fine, except for a few things. One is, that is that asterisk, the age-adjusted death rate is really an artificial statistic. It, it, what it is, is, is it adjusts the, the, the population you're looking at to a certain population so that if somebody is, people are dying at, a, at an earlier, at a later stage, it, it indicates some progress. You also look at deaths when you think about how well we're doing with cancer, not because five-year survival rates aren't important, they are increasing and everything else, but it's a very statistically difficult thing because if you find a cancer earlier, it doesn't necessarily mean that what you did in the meantime did anything to affect the outcome. So this is what happened with, with five-year five -year survival rates. But as I point out, this is kind of a strange statistic because if you look at the actual deaths from cancer, they shoot up like this. And uh, this is the population increased in this time, but this is three times the rate of the population. And the reason for this, the reason for this increase over this time period, has to do with something that everybody knows, I think, or everybody should know if they don't, that age is a major risk factor for cancer. Age is, by the way, a major risk factor for death. It's the major risk factor for death, and it's something that's often overlooked by physicians. I mean, it, it, it happens that when you, when you get older. So, the population is aging and more people are dying of cancer. So this, this number here actually represents, this is deaths, but this kind of increase, of course, is accompanied by a similar increase in, in diagnosed people. And it has to do with the numbers of people who come into the doors of a hospital like this one. It's just going up rapidly. It, it has, 
in the last few years, it has stabilized a little bit, but, and we'll talk about the reasons for that, but still it's pretty horrendous. And there's other things about when you look at the progress in the war, and one thing that we should never forget is this astounding disparity, and we're going back to age-adjusted death rates here, this astounding dis disparity between, uh, between races in America. Uh, some of this has to do with, uh, I think, black Americans' fear of the, me the medical system because of Tuskegee and other things like that. But mostly, I think when I looked into this, it's a marker for poverty and access to medical. You just don't do worse with cancer when you have less access to medical care. And it's, it's profound. The, 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 that's just inexcusable that it, in the United States, the, the, the numbers, even though the, the, the gaps are narrowing, they're, they're, still just, they're still so bad. And but the reason I say that it's mostly due to poverty, and there was a, a large study in Scotland of, of uh, tens of thousands of people, uh, mostly, all, mostly white population, and there too, there was a huge correlation between economic status and the, uh, the outcome. So it, it has a lot to do with economics. But we, if we just go back to the, uh, these age-adjusted death rates again, and we consider them for what, what they are, if you break them down, you see, uh, this is men only. And of course, you, there's the elephant in the room, the, the big red line. It's, it, lung cancer so totally dominates the picture that it almost overwhelms the statistics. And stomach cancer came down long before the, the war on cancer was, was declared because of refrigeration and people were eating less poisoned foods. Uh, colorectal cancer has come down because of better screening. Interesting, this is really interesting to me, that when the PSA test came online, the, the, the incidence of prostate cancer shot way up, but the death rate also went up, which showed, tells you a bit about what the treatments were doing for people. But I'll leave that one alone for a while. Uh, and, but the rest of them are, 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 you know, are pretty simple. And, and if you look at women, you see the same thing. Again, the red line dominates, a, a, a phenomenal story of uh, the pap smear bringing down uh, uterine cancer death rates, breast cancer has come down, again col colorectal cancer has come down uh, because of good screening. But this is the monster, you know, the, the cigarettes consumption, men smoke more than women uh, and w men stop smoking earlier than women and that's why the female lung cancer rate is still has not dropped as much as the men has, but this, these so overwhelmingly drive the numbers that it's very hard to see any, any kind of the noise in, in this other than this driving the cancer rate. So any time you talk about progress in the age-adjusted death rate, with, even with the stipulation that it's not even the real death rate, it, it, it's, it's overwhelmed by this. And this is from a paper that was written recently uh, by Graham Colditz, who's one of the great fathers of uh, epidemiology. Uh, and, and it says that theoretically more than 60% of the cancer deaths in the United States could be prevented uh, by these various public health interventions. Uh, and very early on from when Mary Lasker declared the, and her colleagues declared the war on cancer, the argument was made by a few people that we should be spending more time on prevention than on treatment. But it was always, it's always been about treatment. Treatment is where the glory is. Treatment is where the profits are. And, and that's, that, is, uh, that is the case. But we should never forget, I think, that there is this enormous potential to really do a, a, a huge amount of good by, by, by simply getting fewer people to smoke. And obesity, as you, uh, many of you know, plays an increasing role in, in risk for many kinds of cancer. And of course, we know that that's going up. And a lot of people are saying that even this, the mild progress that we've seen overall is going to be obliterated by the increasing obesity in the American population. And you, you people are cancer specialists. You all know that surgery cures most uh, cancer. If you, if you find it early and get rid of it, it doesn't come back. 90% of people who die from cancer die from the metastases, not from the primary tumor. And uh, this, is, this has been true. The surgery, anesthesia and sepsis were invented in the 19th century. Blood transfusions and everything got better in the 20th century. And, and surgery is, is definitely the, the way the most cancer cures are achieved. And they're, they're real. It's, it's true. And the uh, even better than 
been curing with surgery, of course, is doing something like a pap smear where you find precancerous lesions and people don't even get cancer in the first place. But all this argument about prevention and everything else ignores the, simple, the, the fact that profits and everything else uh, uh, aside, we have to deal with people like this. Everybody does. Cancer is not, you can do everything right. You all know this. It's, it's a genetic roulette. People can get cancer and they end up having metastatic disease. And we, they, there are loved ones, there are ourselves. They have to be treated. And that's got to be a goal. You know, that, no matter how much more there should be, you can argue about prevention, this has still got to be something that we, we've got to try to cure people like this. So you can, you can ask the question, well, the, there was this war on cancer. It started in 1971. Billions and billions of dollars were put into this, uh, increasing, uh, until recently, increasing in, in massive quantities, an enormous amount of, uh, of, of, of research. Uh, and what have, we, what have we gotten from that? Well, what are the, one of the things we've gotten is a huge amount of knowledge. Uh, this is, uh, you're, nobody, you're, none of you is in my class, so you don't have to memorize any of this. But, uh, but this is a, uh, and those of you who are cancer scientists will rec uh, recognize that this is, this is only a small part of a very big picture. But these are, this is what goes on normally in cells to make them grow. This is just the EGF receptor part of it. And every one of these three letter designations is a gene or a protein that is at least a theoretical target for uh, a cancer drug. And so there's a whole lot of them out there. And this whole idea of targeted therapy is the mantra that we've been hearing about for a long time. But for many years after the war on cancer, and then even the first uh, oncogenes were discovered, there, was no, there were no targeted therapies because these things never take uh, as short a time as everybody hopes. But then in uh, 19, in the 19, late 1990s, I heard about one of the first, if not the first, targeted therapy and uh, therapies, and it really interested me. Uh, and it was a drug that ended up being called Herceptin, and I got interested in it. And NBC let me cover it, and I also wrote a book about it. And here's one of the one of the stories that I did about it right after, I, right before I think it won FDA approval. I'm going to show you this. few things I want to say about that. One is that this really was a good drug. And the reason that it really was a good drug is it changed cancer. Uh, and because not then, but as all of you know, breast cancer drugs can be very effective as adjuvant treatments, either just before or just after therapy, uh, just after surgery or radiation to, at the beginning. So that they really can bring a reduction in deaths over time because the cancer doesn't return. So an, a treatment is an, a, an adjuvant treatment is, can be very effective. That's one point I want to make. It. The second thing is in looking at the history of this, the development of this drug, I, I learned an awful lot, which of course is what you're supposed to do when you go into something in detail. But what was really interesting is that this drug, this whole concept of HER2, really revolutionized breast cancer. If you go to a breast cancer meeting now, the, the HER2 and the drugs that treat it make up a huge amount of what's talked about. But even though it's, and I exaggerated the numbers, not on purpose, but it's really closer to about 17% of breast cancers are overexpressed for two. But this drug almost didn't get made. And that's the, the lesson. 
Genentech didn't want to make it because they had made other cancer drugs that had failed. We all know the, the $100 million plus prices of going into phase three development. They, they weren't interested in, in, in it at all and, and they thought that they could never sell a drug that only treated 20% of people with breast cancer. Now, of course, drugs are coming on the market that treat just a tiny percent of people with, with, with all kinds of cancers. But at that time, they were thinking that it couldn't happen. And at every point of it, in fact, the key, the key moment, there were many key moments uh, in this, but one of the key moments was that a man who was an executive in the company's mother had died of breast cancer, and she, and he said, wait, are we, we have a breast cancer drug in, in the pipeline here, right? I, I want to do something about breast cancer. And he, he, he was executive vice president, and he made it happen. And so they brought it to trial. But it same, came so close to not happening, to not being on the market, and it eventually. But, and I wish I could tell you that from what we know about drugs, uh, that it's different now, that it's not an arbitrary process. But I'm afraid to say it still is an arbitrary process because well, no matter how well something works, as many of your scientists know, if how well something works in a mouse or in, a, in vitro, it doesn't, that doesn't guarantee at all how it's going to work in a human being and you've got to do the trials and it just be it becomes very difficult. And the other thing that I want to take away, the message you want to take away from that is, is a criticism of me and others in the media, especially television, but it's always the same, is that you have a person who is at death's door, she gets the drug, she gets better, she's, everything is rosy, the, you can see that the scans are clear, and it's one, except it doesn't have a lot of caveats, so, such as how many people really did it really work in, how many people didn't it work in, and, it, and to the public, and, and I don't even know a way to do this differently, it always looks the same. It always looks the same almost dead, gets better, and, and the person. And, and that's uh, uh, something that we, I, I always struggle with. I don't know how to deal with it. I, I actually have another example of the same thing, which I could show you. This is, a, this is a study at Johns Hopkins, and I actually did one at Yale, too, about the new immune therapies. That, and, and Roy Herbst, who's in the front row here, was, was in, the, in the one, so he could testify that that's true. But again, I, I won't show it to you, but it, it shows, again, people, death store, various kinds of cancers, they do better. And, and immune therapies, anybody will say, this is one of the most exciting areas for potential future treatments of these immune therapies, and yet they're not there yet. And if we look at things uh, yet that are, that are not so quite exciting, we run into the other big problem, which is a big issue in, in, in talking about the media and, and, and cancer. And we can show this. A lot of you are familiar with Kaplan-Meier curves. This is the percentage of people who are surviving at 100% over the number of months that the treatment is given. And this is for advanced colon cancer colorectal cancer. And this bottom, the bottom line there was the standard of care until two, uh, the year 2000. And that standard of care was, was a drug, mostly 5-FU, which was approved in 1953 by the FDA, and that, that was how people with advanced colon cancer did. Then came along, they added uh, Glenn Saltz uh, at uh, Memorial, added the drug of Renotican, and look what he got. He got a 1.2 month average gain of survival. This was such a big deal at the time that this, this chart was shown on the back page of the New England Journal of Medicine for months at a time, showing what great progress we were making uh, against uh, colorectal cancer. And what, ha what happened when, when you, to get that great process, the, the cost for eight weeks treatment, that's what happened to the cost for eight weeks treatment of the drug. And then four months, uh, four years later, uh, they added, this was essentially the best one from the last one, they added bevacizumab, which is Avastin, to the treatment, and they got almost five months more average treatment. And what did that, uh, average survival rather, uh, by adding that drug, and what did that do to the price? That's what it did to the price. The, the, these numbers come from Deb Schrag, who was at MD Anderson, is now at uh, Dana-Farber. And there was other drugs in there that could make it even more expensive. So we're, we're familiar with this. this is, these drugs are horribly expensive. And in fact, they're so horribly expensive 
And here's a list of them. You start with Herceptin. These are monthly costs for the drugs of Aston we talked about. Vervoy is uh, ipilimumab, uh, immune treatment. Look at that. Uh, and, and, and on it goes. And I, I'm not going to take time here to, to make the argument whether these drugs are uh, priced properly or anything like that because I know the cost of, I've alluded to the cost of development being so high, but it's a huge, huge issue. And it's an unsustainable situation. The, the, it even though, and uh, Dr. Lynch pointed out when he talked to my class, that cancer drugs make up only about 18% of the costs of, of treating cancer patients, these are still enormous, enormous costs. So if you get back to the media, we get, you know, get this. This is a, the cover of New York Magazine from a few months ago. Uh, and people are starting to pay attention to this. Now this, and, and the author of this, Steve, Stephen Hall, is, is a very good journalist in my opinion, uh, but he didn't just come up with this himself thinking about the ideas. The, the reason was there started to be a little bit of pushback from doctors. Uh, the same Len Saltz who we just talked about, uh, they wrote an op-ed piece in the, in the New York Times that uh, no, uh, Sanofi, came on with a Me Too drug for Avastin and charged twice the price, uh, twice of the already outrageous price. And Sloan Kettering just said, we're not gonna, we're not gonna pay it. And uh, immediately, uh, Sanofi dropped the price. <laughs> uh, the same thing, then the next bit of pushback that's come recently this year was from uh, a whole bunch of leukemia doctors talking about the price of, uh, uh, of Grivac, and which has gotten way up even since it came on the market, and it's a it's a truly miraculous drug when it does work. It really does cure people. Uh, and Brian Drucker's famous quote to the New York Times: "If you're making three billion dollars to dollars uh, a year on Grivac, could you get by with two billion? Novartis didn't respond to that. They they still charge the same price. And then recently, in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute, the uh, uh, some people from uh, MD Anderson and from uh, NCI were, tried to map out what could be a just price for uh, cancer drugs, what, what might be a just price for, for cancer drugs. And as soon as this article appeared, predictably, there was articles in the National Review and other conservative journals saying death panels, uh, rationing, and Obamacare, this article didn't mention anything about rationing, anything about, it just started to have, possibly have a conversation about uh, drug pricing and how to set it and what's re what might be reasonable, how we as a society might decide what, what's right, but never mind. It, the, the outlet, it just was an astounding amount of backlash against, against this article. So where does, that, where does that leave us? I don't know. <laughs> I don't have a solution to this. I wish I, I wish I could come up with some magical solutions for these things. But I want to make a make a point here, which is so. When, when I write this this book about Herceptin, uh, it was actually made into a movie. It was made into a made-for-TV movie. Now, who would think if you write a book about drug development, it's going to be made into a movie? Uh, the uh, person, the, the the person who and in fact, it was for for a while the biggest sales of the book were was a textbook in business school classes on drug development. I was that for a boring, sounding topic. So, this is the closing scene of the movie. Um, Harry Connick, Jr., played Dennis Slayman at UCLA, who was the biggest academic proponent. In fact, you could certainly say he he made Herceptin happen. And the movie opens with and uh, Slayman was a uh, uh, amateur runner, and it shows him running, and things are really bad. Genentech has turned him down. He can't get money from the NIH he's, uh, for his project because it's it's too out of the box, and he, everything is miserable. Then the, the thing works, and the drug is 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 headed for approval. Women are are living who wouldn't have lived before, and this is the closing scene of the movie.
So, my hope is that each and every one of you who are working in so hard and on the front lines of cancer end up having that kind of celebration in your honor because I think you deserve it. And I also hope that someday maybe somebody who is working in prevention uh, and public health uh, can get that kind of recognition and, and, and that honor. But uh, let, let's hope it, all, all stories end up to be that. Okay, good. So what, I'm going to end there. Thank you very much. Uh, I left a lot of time on purpose to take questions because a lot of times people <laughs> want to ask questions about media people. If not, uh, thank you for coming out on the bad weather, but I appreciate it. So the, the first question should go to Dr. DeVita. <laughs> oh, here we go again. This is we've been doing this since the 1980s. <laughs> I enjoyed your talk as always, um, and he's been one of the best science writers in Washington in, in my experience. But I want to correct a couple of misconceptions. First of all, we didn't make the war on cancer about treatment, you did. Uh, when I was director and now, the budget for treatment in the cancer institute is about 18%. Much more is spent on everything else. Second. The last time I looked, diagnosis and prevention was part of the war on cancer. It's actually like it's sort of not, you know, it's happening. Oh, I didn't mean to imply it's not. I absolutely agree with you. It's a question of, you but, know. But there's something else. I mean, the, the, the biggest misconception, the decline in mortality, for example, in breast cancer, uh, two-thirds of it due to treatment, one-third is due to screening. In colorectal cancer, half of it's due to treatment and half of it's due to screening. And where do you think those treatments came from? You talk about how expensive it is to get two months worth of life in advanced colorectal cancer, but those programs that are developed in advanced disease are used in the adjuvant situation, and that's where they prevent recurrences and prolong life, and that's where you get the economic benefit. It's not fair to talk about how much it costs in advanced disease for two months without saying how many years and years of life you get in the average adjuvant well, situation. Well, but that the prolonged ca colorectal cancer has not done so well in the adjuvant setting, and that's one of the problems. And the last point is that the two economists, Topols and Murphy from the University of Chicago, did a, a study uh, some years ago, um, not that long ago, but maybe six, seven years ago, where they looked at all of health and the benefits of, of uh, investing in research. And their conclusion, and they're not related to any cancer program that I know of, was that a 20% decline in mortality from cancer, which we have now achieved, is worth 10 trillion, that's a T, trillion dollars. So we've invested $70 billion in cancer research, and we got $10 trillion in return. And if you knew a stock that does that well, please let me know. I'd like well, to invest And absolutely. I, I, don't dis I certainly agree with you. And the second thing is, that, to follow up on that point, 25% of Americans still smoke cigarettes. And if we could get that even down, you can, you can do the same math and have the same savings. Could I ask one favor? Can you go back a couple of slides? I wanted to show you one thing. Which one? Not pushback. Keep going. Keep going. The Herceptin story. Go back one more. Okay. Just go ahead. Just start. You want to see more? Just start. You'll see it. Stop. Stop. Okay. So this is something that it's not, it, Bob, it's not you. It's society. Okay. It's journalism. It's the media. It's the way this is presented. Is that she's presented as a fighter, as someone who refused to accept 
her death sentence. And the, what that does to our patients is give them a sense of guilt and blame when they die. Because no one accepts or no one refuses to fight, in my mind. But it's not a media thing as much as it's a public perception that if you're a fighter and you refuse to accept the diagnosis, you have a great chance. You can really do it. There are hundreds and thousands and millions of people who died of lung cancer, pancreas cancer, bladder cancer, breast cancer, brain cancers, who were equal to her in her desire to fight. And I guess the question to you is, and again, it, there's, I understand why the story is written this way, because this is the way, as a public, we like to think. We, there's something incredibly reassuring to all of us that if we just fight and we refuse to accept the diagnosis, we too can have this outcome when we get cancer. I don't mean to be harsh, but... Oh, no, you're not being harsh okay. at all, and it's an incredibly important point. And I know from experience with a, a, a very close friend who went to see a very famous, and I certainly not, won't name the doctor or the hospital, uh, oncologist. And he, this oncologist tells all of his patients, I have two people who come in at your stage of disease. I have those who want to fight and those who want to give up. And if you're not a fighter, I'm not even interested in talking to you. And that attitude has permeated it has. cancer research on the, on the medical side and the, certainly the journalistic side. Uh, so well, I'll take responsibility for it, but I certainly won't take sole responsibility. Oh, no, 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 and I didn't. <laughs> and and, I, and I'm, I feel really bad because you gave a great talk. But the point was, is it's, not, it's not just this piece. It's, hey, the story that talked about the ERISA EGFR mutation story on ABC in 2004 had almost exactly the oh, same yeah. language. If I showed okay. you those Johns Hopkins people, they, they, so, you know, one person gets up and says, Suzanne Tapalian is probably saying exactly the same thing. Yeah. And, and we're as responsible as you are. I'm saying it's a collective guilt. But here to comment, and I'm going to ask Dr. Levy to talk a little bit about the signal. So I'm nodding his head. Do you, think, who, do you think we're crazy by saying this? Not at all. Uh, there was a, uh, there's a physician who I won't mention uh, who uh, basically built a career on teaching people that they could, um, if they had the right attitude, they could beat their cancer. And he, he, he made a fortune. He wrote several books. And he's a local person. He's a colleague of yours. That's correct. Yes. I didn't want to mention names. And I remember <laughs> patients saying, t I remember patients saying, t wife of a patient saying to me after her husband died, that we feel so guilty because we were told that if we loved him enough, he would survive. And we loved him so much, and he didn't survive. And they felt guilty. So, and this is something that we dealt with for a lot of years. It's kind of quieted down in this, with in Bernie. this community. Yeah. yeah. But I remember when Bernie Siegel's book came out, what, what, Love, Medicine Love Medicine Miracles, what it did, I was a first or second year fellow when the book came out. And what it did was it empowered all of us. I felt really good about being an oncologist because I thought, well, okay, even if the chemotherapy doesn't work, Love Medicine and Miracles will, okay? <laughs> and, and it's something that it was just, just to think of our fellows. I mean, think about you guys. You think, well, you know, the drugs aren't working, but we've got Love and Miracles. <laughs> Some patients who refused the chemo, the treatment part. Yeah. When we had the few effects. So, so in the second half of this story? Did, you want to see the second half of this story? Well, I'm just asking, it, did, does it, does it mention what the response rates to Herceptin? Because yeah, I think it, 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 it also and, and it has a hero of, of De Dennis Lehman, and it make and it has a hero of a Genentech guy. Uh, hero, you know, quotes to how happy they are the things. But yes, almost does, nobody, but here's the almost thing. no one is cured. Yes, they are. There's By Vince's disease? point. No, no. That Vince's point is this led. No, 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 no. Yes, There's but this woman. led to increasing the cure rate in adjuvant therapy. Mm -hmm. I get that, but yes. this woman came in with liver mets. Yeah, and she's cured. Now, now that's basically well, never it happened. Ha it does I know, happen. But it that's does happen. And as to Dr. DeVita's point, uh, when it can be transferred to the adjuvant setting, it does but, save lives uh, because it, it reduces recurrences. However, adjuvant therapy, unfortunately, you, you people know far better than me, hasn't worked for every kind of cancer. Right. No and, uh, and, and that's uh, and then so you've got these situations where you have these drugs that you're giving to people who on a and it's an average some people live to uh, you know to 
pay full back for the Green Bay Packers or whatever. But the, the, for the most part, uh, the average is a few months for many thousands of dollars. Dr. Herbst. Yeah, I have two points. I think one thing that, <coughs> that happens with this, too, is that patients see this and then they come in and their expectations are such, I want what she got. And, you know, sometimes we see that, and I, I think the physicians that are involved in these types of stories have to be prepared that people are coming in with expectations that might be higher than what can be uh, given to any given patient. But what I was going to ask you is the role of the, um, the hospital media group uh, in, in, in how you choose patients and stories uh, for the news. So as, as stories come out, how important is it for Yale or for MD Anderson Memorial, the group that, that works with media relations in working with you at NBC or where other, other groups to, to have their patients in the stories? How does that work? Well, look, it's, a, it's a very important, and it's, a, it's the dirty secret of the whole thing uh, about the relationship between uh, the media and, and medicine in, in this term because when we do a story we need a character you, 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 as much as you'd like, rather have a statistical overview of some situation the, the way you tell a story is to tell a person's story and the most compelling story the more compelling possible unless I happen to know somebody uh, myself which is very rare the way that I get a patient if I'm doing a story which I did on your work uh, fairly, one of my last stories at NBC uh, was I go to the, the, the people here and they say, well, here's a patient and they're sure not going to give me somebody who died and so I can go over and interview their relatives, which might be appropriate, by the way. I mean, as cruel as that is, it might be more, much more appropriate. The editors wouldn't like it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They wouldn't mind it as much as Yale New Haven would mind, or than Smiley would mind it. Whatever this place is called, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, the uh, but First of all, it, it's a really dicey ethical thing, in my opinion. I, I, mean, I always did it because I, there was no other way. But the only way that we get patients is we go to the PR people. The PR people call the doctors and say, do you have a patient who would be good? Uh, you've got this paper coming out in a major journal, and we wanna, you know, we've got media interest in it. You say to the patient, you don't have to do this, but it would be, a, but you know, you have such a powerful relationship over a patient, particularly if a patient uh, did have liver mets and has, has now is fine, it's clear, they're going to be very grateful to you and want to be on television. And maybe, and for some people, it's incredibly therapeutic and it's wonderful, but it also, do, are you really giving them a choice? I, these are not, I don't have answers to these questions. They're very important, though. Susan? So thank you, I enjoyed it. So as you know, um, some of our research looks at message framing. And I could walk away from this talk and say, you know, certain slides say we should absolutely be investing in biomedical research, see the gains that we've made in cancer research. Some of the slides show that. Or you could look at the converse and say, for all that investment, we've got these little bitty gains and we've got these expensive drugs that are prolonging life only a little bit. And my question to you is, you know, I mean, we're all convinced in this room that we need more investment in biomedical research. We're in a crisis right now with NIH funding, and how do we work with media? Are people out there trying to really get the message out to show our Congress why we need to make these investments and why it impacts all of us? So I'm, I'm thinking about how do we turn this message around in a positive way, and can you help us think about ways to really get investments that we need? Well, yeah, that's one of the things I'm trying to do here, and I want to actually want to get started in a project in the School of Public Health. This is Dr. Main from is chair of uh, nutrition of, of chronic disease epidemiology. In case you don't know, and did, has done some brilliant work on this. The the I, in theory, the public supports biomedical research. There are a lot of studies show that. There is no question about that. It's always a question of priorities when it comes down to it at the end of the day and, and, and right now in the, in the current environment. And everybody thinks that there, nobody would say, you know, we should spend less money on cancer, whether it's prevention or uh, basic science, cell science or, or better treatments for advanced disease. Nobody's going to say, no, we shouldn't do that. It's a question of how, how you, you get the priorities. And there is another problem, though. That I'm, that here's a, another dirty little secret in all this, in my opinion, and, and Dr. DeVita may have a, a really something to say about this. A lot of science is crap right now because the enterprise, because the NIH budget doubled uh, in, in the 90s, and, and a lot of, uh, a lot of, and there's a, in this proliferation of lower level journals, and this very important paper came out, uh, in my opinion, important paper came out last year where scientists at Amgen tried to replicate 
uh, the, a bunch of papers that were, were pre, uh, that were allegedly on the road to finding molecules that could become cancer drugs. And they couldn't replicate more than 70% of the papers. And it wasn't just them. It turns out everybody sort of like, yeah, see, yeah, there's all these papers out there that can't be replicated. There's all these papers out there that get published and never get cited again, not even once. And nobody in science wants to stand up and say, we got to clean up our act and, and make for a better science program that is much more efficient and using the money we have because the R01 grants, which is a complicated way most science is funded from the NIH, are given mostly because the scoring level is so low to get one. It almost has to be something that you know is going to work before you try it. So this whole idea of getting people to do something novel and, and how you do that is a very important question. But there's a very much timidity among scientists leading scientists who, pub, uh, who are involved in policy to talk about how they could do a better job of using the money for fear of getting less money, because fear of somebody in Congress will come along and say, oh, you, you, you could have been us using the money. So Bob, another question for you. I think while I was critical of the one point about her fighting, the one thing I think this story shows is you've chosen your stories remarkably well and have followed, particularly with your book, followed a great lead with great science. I think we'd all agree Herceptin is probably one of the top two or three things in my entire career that you can look at, which has saved lives and really changed how women do with breast cancer. You must get thousands of leads. How do you, as a journalist, how do you evaluate the laetrils from the Herceptins? For well, those who right don't remember you. Laetril, yeah. Laetril was a, a, a compound from Mexico you know, 50, uh, 30 years ago that was purportedly to have anti-cancer properties. But how do you, as a layman, sort through all this and pick the Herceptins and not do feature stories on, on things that, that are less than compelling? Well, that's a question of journalistic judgment, which is, you know, how do you pick what you think is important, to, where you do in your clinic, you know, what you do here, or what do the scientists do in their labs? There's, you know, this, that cuts to how good you are at your profession. And we depend a lot, maybe too much, on journals, uh, but it's not such a bad thing. A lot of stuff that, that's reported it comes out in major journals so that it, it's already been peer reviewed before the, the media even touch it. So that, that's another part of it. But, and I'm not quite a lay person. I was trained uh, as a scientist before. I, that's why I'm in this department here. Okay. <laughs> so. Yes? This may not be a fair question, but so many people now get their information from social media, um, and a lot of it is misinformation because, you know, you know these are people you and you go to doctors for these things. Do you have any idea how we can start to combat? Um, sorry, I'm pretty loud. Yeah. You have a good how great can, voice. <laughs> I'm a teacher. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. How we can start to combat um, all this misinformation that gets out there in social media? Because unlike NBC, you know, my cousin can post 20 ways to cure cancer, and I, I yell at her when she does it. But <laughs> other than having a cousin who's in cancer research, like there's certainly there's always been a lot of noise uh, and phony treatments and things, and the internet only makes it worse. Although sometimes there's some really interesting examples of uh, social media and the internet making things better. For instance, when Gleevec started to work, in the earliest phase one trial, and just even a few patients, the, the people who had that kind of CML uh, were so connected to one another that everybody knew right away that there was a really effective drug. And you didn't have to do a whole lot of, of uh, convincing of the FDA or anybody else, and the drug went ahead much very quickly. So when something does work, the, the social media keeps the patients plugged in enough that, that they know, they know. But yeah, and there are good websites and bad websites, and, and I don't, and you know, it, until there are really genuine treatments for anything, whether it's cancer or something else, there's gonna be a lot of garbage and there's gonna be a lot of nonsense. You know, you don't see a lot of internet sites about uh, things that can be easily treated by antibiotics because they can be easily treated by antibiotics, and you don't have to have mythology about it. So one of the interesting things about social media um, that infects the, the investment community is because people are so vocal on Twitter or other areas, um, there are now people who are trying to project clinical trial results for investors based on chatter on social media for patients who are subjects in clinical trials. 
And the question then becomes, do you have, as an academic medical center, the right to prohibit patients from going on to social media? The answer is probably not. You probably don't. Um, and then you've got guys trying to game the system on, you know, the, the latest uh, breakthrough drug, uh, Herceptin squared, um, and by, by trying to pick up chatter of women who are on Herceptin squared versus plain old Herceptin in terms of how they're doing. So there's all kinds of interesting questions that social media brings up uh, at this point. Renee, did you have your hand up in the back? No. Renee is someone who actually understands social media. Actually, maybe all you guys understand social media. I haven't quite figured it out completely myself. Questions? One more. We have time for one more question. Okay. Seeing none. Bob, thank you for a fantastic thank talk. You.